Note, this video does not advocate nor encourage the use of psychoactive drugs of any kind, be it legal or illegal in the writer of origin's country, the banner of which covers anything from caffeine to heroin. Yes, caffeine is also psychoactive, and yes, it can also present harm when used irresponsibly. Ultimately, the only way to avoid the harm associated with drugs is to not use them at all. And with that, on with the video. Given that my last two videos explicitly addressed my substance use in a way more overt and perhaps to some with less context more worryingly than I ever have before, I thought I would answer a question that no doubt graced a few viewers' minds, one that extends beyond the central premise of why am I like this as seen in the story of my enslavement, to why and how I engage with the subject that I used as a shorthand to explain the prior question, that shorthand being drugs, the why for which leads me to several sometimes conflicting conclusions that all boil down to circumstance showcasing the diversity in effects one can no doubt receive from the world of pharmacology when accounting for dose, individual psychology, and substance. In that video, the why I focused on primarily was this broad idea of autonomy, expressed in the form of self-medication, serving as more of a backdrop for this broader story of how I interface with feelings. But in that, there exists, of course, minutia, as not all feelings present the same way in different circumstances and all feelings differ from one another in their own ways. Here, I will attempt to categorize by number the types of experiences I may look for under certain circumstances, and as such, the feelings and type of drug that may come with it, after which the way in which I go about drug use, the how, will become more self-evident. Number 1. Novelty, Curiosity, and Fascination Three things I lump in the same category because they all seem to stem from the same fundamental urge, an urge that I felt for as long as I can remember, to compare and contrast feelings altered states of consciousness give me. As a child, I can vividly recall being sick and asking my doctor the specifics about how medication would affect me. Taking the medications with what I was told in mind and waiting to observe the subtle changes in my emotional and or physiological state. Before long, similar questions were hurled at my parents who both took medications of some kind and could give rudimentary explanations on what they were. When I got access to the internet, I uncovered a maelstrom of resources pertaining to every question I wanted to ask. It was all a matter of typing in the name of the medicines in question, and, as I would come to find out, the class they belonged to. There was something viscerally fascinating about the fact that a molecule could have such wide-ranging, or not, implications on the human body and psyche, that we as humans could harness the power of said molecules for certain express purposes. The novelty involved with that was just as visceral and how it fascinated me, as it naturally extended from the passion I derived from observing any change in consciousness unaided by the ingestion of a compound, be it stubbing my toe or riding on a roller coaster. Now I was offered an avenue to observe novelty all the more intense in its potential. I believe this is why I was so gung-ho about taking antidepressants in my early teens, aside from the fact that I was interested in anything that could potentially improve or enhance my life, that fascination for how my mind might change carried over. Even if it may change for the worst, the mere fact that any alteration was possible with the introduction of a new compound was in itself the goal. A different experience was inherently viewed as positive because it was different. With different came experience, with that came observations. Observations fueled me intellectually, which fueled me emotionally. I was as curious as I was fascinated seeking novelty. Codifying these experiences into something comprehensible to myself was seen as an untenable goal once I was made aware of illicit substances, for no other reason than the fact that I would not know what I was taking. The idea of an unregulated market with no clear indication of what dose is a safe dose, even if you do know what you are taking, was a terrifying prospect to my younger and current self. Therefore, my experiments were relegated to that which was legally sanctioned in the pharmaceutical industry, until I discovered reagent testing and to a lesser extent other harm reduction methods like titrating one's dosage upward to get a sense of the effects. It was these discoveries that really brought on my debut into recreational drug use, because here was a way I could identify that 
what I was sold was what it was advertised as, and know what an active dose is, with low, medium, and common dosages, in others being used as a reference point to guide various self-experiments, seeking to ascertain if the compound yielded similar results in myself. These things made me feel safer, quelling my neuroticism and fueling my curiosity as the questions I wanted to answer through subjective experience could be answered in a way that felt more comprehensible. Without that combination of neuroticism and curiosity, I would not be here today writing this video, or the other videos you've recently seen as the subject matter would not be relevant to me. It became relevant only through safer techniques to explore these compounds being made known. Number two, functional purposes. Here we enter two classes of drugs primarily stimulants and depressants, drugs that when you get into the specifics can't always be used for functional purposes with individual compounds. But what are these two classes, and what is a functional purpose? A central nervous system stimulant, or CNS for short, and a CNS depressant are the polar opposites of one another. The former brings about energy, perhaps enhances one's focus, confidence, and motivation, whereas the latter slows down one's mental faculties, lessening one's energy, causing a disengagement inhibiting effect, where you care less about the world around you, the things you say. The most prominent example of this is alcohol, the carefree way words flow from one's mouth. Psychologically, this effect can be so euphoric for the user that it almost seems like one has taken a stimulant, dashing and dancing in appraisal for the carefree state they've entered, but they're only here because of the depressant effect on the central nervous system. We've all heard anecdotal stories of people drinking alcohol in small quantities before or events to simmer down their social anxiety, with the goal being to not become so disinhibited that there is no care at all for what one says, and to have more difficulty exerting control over what one says, but to foster a greater sense of calmness to appear more functional, that is to say, more normal within the confines of the expectations of the social event, making the user resemble a better version of themselves sober, or to better their performance in a task, is the essence of a function experience. This story, then, only applies to people with anxiety going into that event, as they would be functional without the drug if they were not anxious. It also only applies if the quantity consumed does not exceed a functional amount for the aforementioned anxious person. Are you seeing how individual circumstance and dose become relevant to these why and how questions? A CNS stimulant, on the other hand, may be relevant to the socially anxious party in a different way particularly if they struggle with confidence and motivation. Rather than put down an immediate sense of worry as a social lubricant, the world becomes an immediate worry. Sometimes this sense of being there, wholly there, makes the user more confident in their actions, and as such, more able to enact them. This is certainly the way I feel under the influence of CNS stimulants, which is why I prefer them to depressants for social events. If used in a functional dose, every minute detail of the world becomes more abundantly fascinating, in a way that isn't so overbearingly euphoric that I find it necessary to talk constantly, or interrupt in a stupor of confidence for that matter. It is that sweet spot where I feel clearly energized but self-aware, clearly motivated but not so motivated that I jump from task to task without finishing one. A sort of singular focus that lasts for a longer duration and with greater immersion than in my sober state. No doubt this class has been of particular help to me when I've suffered from depression and fatigue. Depressants, in contrast, only really provide functionality for me insofar as they make me stop caring about some immediate trauma I've recalled, and can't shake through other means. 2.5 Afterglow. This arguably falls in the same category as functional purposes, the main distinction being that an afterglow occurs following the end of an intoxicating experience. A drug may not be detectable in your body, but it continues to affect you after the experience. It can be found in a renewed appreciation for life following a difficult or revealing psychedelic trip, or a rapid antidepressant effect I found in the use of ketamine. Two things there exist now, empirical evidence for. The draw to Afterglow is obviously that it imbues us with a greater sense of well-being overall in our everyday, sober life. I experience this with ketamine when used in modest amounts, and also with LSD as it completely and utterly eradicates my desire for any drugs weeks, sometimes months after the experience. Number three, 
introspection, changing my mind, and especially the disillusion of my biases, psychedelics changed my life. Not only the ones we would commonly think of upon hearing the term, like LSD and psilocybin, but newly emerging psychedelics, especially of the dissociative variety, like Freemio PCP or DMXE, the latter of which seemed to aid unbiased introspection the most, opening me up to different ideas in a way more visceral and intuitive than anything else. The others more regularly known to you seem to teach me lessons about myself and my metaphysical perspective in a way that breaks the barrier between the intellectual and the emotional. If there are thoughts or traumas I need to explore in a way that makes them feel solidified, the classic psychedelics do the job, providing emotional experience that corresponds to what I may know to be be true intellectually, but have not yet fully made the intuitive connection yet. After the experience, I am left with the sense that I holistically know something, a concrete sense that carries over into my sober life and in every conceivable sense changes my mind. Another example of this kind of beneficial introspection has been the MDMA experiences I've had, a drug that is likely soon to be in use for PTSD in the United States. Following my MDMA experiences, traumas that once wreaked havoc on me every day of my life cease to have power over me. I feel calm in the face of them. The kind of learning that causes fear to be extinct. Transformative experiences. Number four, recreation and media enhancement. Fun. Recreation is purely about fun. There is no pretension here, no need to solve some lingering problem through introspection or explore novelty or my curiosity. There is familiarity in recreation, the comfort one derives from euphoric experiences fun, euphoria. I put media in this category as well because consuming music or film under the influence never feels particularly productive to me. It's just fun. Certain dissociatives lend themselves more to video games and visual media, while certain stimulants lend themselves more to listening to music. If you were to name just about any drug in the recreational experience or activity it's best suited for, I could tell you. I'm quite partial to walks and nature under the influence of lighter, lesser-known psychedelics. 4.5. De-stressing. This is another one of those extra categories that you could reasonably say fit together with others I've previously set. Where de-stressing is set apart from pure recreation for me is its therapeutic component. If I had a tough day, it caps the day off in a satisfying way, offering a nice enough end to it to awake the next day in better spirits. Depressants and marijuana are the most apt for this purpose, typically combined as I see most depressants merely as an enhancer for marijuana. Number five, to provide a subjective reference point for my research. Every aspect of the world of psychoactive substances is deeply fascinating to me, and as such, I research its various components every day. Something you will inevitably encounter in said research, however, is descriptions of the effects of these substances and the explanations for them scientifically and anecdotally. Without a subjective reference point for this research, it feels somewhat hollow, as though a part of the story is missing, a through line that would otherwise connect it all together. Therefore, my subjective experiences inform my subsequent compartmentalization of my research. Without it, I would not feel I fully understand, much in the same way that an ethnomusicologist would not feel entirely right in their field without having listened to music. 5.5. To educate others and promote safety in the world of psychoactive drugs, particularly those newly emerging. If we're talking about categories, by far the largest and broadest I've seen sampled from is under the moniker of research chemicals, or newly emerging psychoactive substances. These come from every class of recreational drug, with their common facet being that they either 1. emerge as a product of prohibition, chemists tweaking an existing molecule to override existing bands, or 2. were a product of actual research, factors into number 1 nonetheless. The long and short term effects of these compounds are more difficult to ascertain than with compounds with an established history of use, inviting the fascination of future guinea pigs like myself who are motivated by a desire for novelty and to share the findings of their self-experiments, their passion for which is rivaled in vastness only by the variance in effects this category is seemingly endlessly capable of producing. 
This is one topic, if the general topic of drugs weren't enough, where many of my friends consider me an expert, and it is indeed that expertise, or the pursuit of it, that factors into why and how I use drugs, because the more knowledge I accrue, the more I will be in a position to help people have a safer and more positive experience. Through my knowledge, individual people's lives can be changed for the better, and that changes the world. For that reason, I find it imperative that I consume information from all sources and sides of the issue as I consume all drugs I get my hands on. Again and again, I will emphasize that drugs require a great amount of respect to use responsibly, as they are more powerful and potentially dangerous tools than perhaps anything else in existence. It is for that reason I refuse to lead the lemmings to the cliff by setting a bad example. In the end, that's why and how I use drugs.